Hey class, so I just wanted to go over kind of the highlights from chapter four for you. So I'll try and keep this short and sweet and I'm really just gonna highlight what you'll see on the quiz especially um, and just give you kind of a broad overview of chapter four on civil liberties. And this chapter pretty much just focuses and gives you more of an in-depth look at the Bill of Rights which are those first 10 amendments to our Constitution. So a little intro again, the Constitution as it was originally written by the founders didn't really guarantee that many rights or liberties to citizens. It was more about the organization of the government and who would have power and for how long and who would elect who. So it did not contain a Bill of Rights originally, although when we talked about um, in the previous weeks, the writing of the Constitution, of course, those anti-federalists and the people who wanted to um, see more power given to the states and not to the national government in agreeing to ratify the Constitution, their negotiation was that they would only ratify it if a Bill of Rights was going to follow quickly, and it did. So many of the framers thought that they had adequately covered citizens' rights in the original text of the Constitution, so those Federalists thought that they had, and they pointed to Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution to kind of defend their um, perspective. And if we look at Article 1, Section 9, it does list three um, specific protections against government overreach. So this will be one of your quiz questions here. So um, what are those three liberties or rights that are covered in Article 1, Section 9? So number one, it prohibits the passage of bills of attainder. And that basically means you can't pass a law and convict or punish someone for a crime without a trial. Number two, it prohibits ex post facto laws. That means if you smoked a cigarette today and the government tomorrow outlawed or banned smoking cigarettes for anyone, um, and then the government came to you and said, well, you're under arrest for smoking a cigarette, um, the day before we pass this law, that would be unconstitutional. So you can't pass a law and then retroactively punish someone for um, disobeying a law that wasn't a law at the time it was committed. Number three, um, the Congress is limited in its ability to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. And that means the guarantee that a neutral judge will decide whether someone has been lawfully detained. All right, this will be another quiz question you'll see. So the Bill of Rights and the Ten Amendments that it consists of can be kind of sorted into three different broad categories. So Amendments 1, 2, 3, and 4 can be categorized as protections of basic individual freedoms. Amendments 5, 6, 7, and 8 can be categorized as protections for people suspected or accused of crimes. And Amendments 9 and 10 are protections of rights not specifically listed and guarantees of state authority. So now we'll go through these 10 amendments. There's um, one, two, three questions on the quiz that come out of the material on the First Amendment. So we're going to really focus in on the First Amendment here for a minute. So the First Amendment, arguably the most famous and the most extensive of the provisions within the Bill of Rights. There's a lot covered in this one little sentence. 
so it guarantees both religious freedoms and the right to express our views in public. And it reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So the First Amendment contains a whole lot in there. So we're going to kind of pick apart each each clause within the First Amendment. So number one, we've got the Establishment Clause. And the First Amendment protects two types of religious freedom. So number one, it says that the federal government can't have an official sponsored religion the way that um, you know England and the Church of England had. And number two, it says that the government cannot prohibit any citizen from exercising the religion that they want to. So that first part saying that the government cannot establish an official religion is what we call the establishment clause. And that protects people from having a set of religious beliefs imposed on them by the government. Now, in the Supreme Court case, Lemon versus Kurtzman, the court established what we call the Lemon Test for deciding whether a law or government action that might promote a religious practice should be allowed to stand. So we'll go through the criteria and then I'll give you an example of um, what this means and how it applies to the First Amendment. So the lemon test, it has three criteria that have to be met if a law that might be suspected of promoting religious practice um, is going to be found constitutional. So number one, the action or law must not lead to excessive government entanglement with religion. The government shouldn't have to invest a bunch of money or um, hire a lot of new staff in order to um, enact a law that has something to do with a religious practice. Number two, the action or law cannot either inhibit or advance religious practice. So it should be neutral in its effects. And number three, the action or law must have some secular purpose, meaning some sort of non-religious justification for why the law should be enacted. So here's an example. So imagine Georgia decided to fund a school voucher program that allows children to attend private and parochial schools at public expense. So a parochial school is like a Catholic school or a Christian school. So the vouchers can only be used to pay for school books and transportation to and from the school. So let's go through the lemon test. Does it have a secular purpose? Well, educating children is a clear non-religious purpose. So the law can be argued to have a secular purpose. Number two, would it inhibit or advance religious practice? Not necessarily because it's the voucher program and as a voucher program, it gives children and their parents a range of schools to choose from. So it's not requiring that any child attends a parochial or religious school. It's just part of the choices. And then number three, um, since the bill that is the example we're talking about um, doesn't, um, it doesn't pay for um, teacher salaries at a Catholic school and it doesn't pay for improvements to a religious school. It's only providing money for school books and transportation. And so for that reason, the courts would argue it's probably unlikely the program would lead to excessive religious entanglement because providing school books and transportation is something that's pretty regularly provided by the government regardless of um, religious entanglements. 
So in this case, a, um, a law such as this would pass the lemon test as the court sees it. However, again, if the law did allow for um, the voucher funding to pay um, a Catholic teacher's at a Catholic school, um, their salary or pay for the improvements to a religious school's facilities, it would be more difficult to argue that that law would not lead to government entanglement with religion. So the second part of the First Amendment, um, so our second clause has to do with freedom of expression, including our rights to speech, press, assembly, and petition. So we're going to focus on freedom of the press here. So in 1931, there was a Supreme Court case, Near versus Minnesota, and the Supreme Court ruled that the government cannot engage in what we're going to call prior restraint. And prior restraint means that the government can't prohibit or block someone from publishing something in the press without a very compelling reason. So if you've ever um, studied kind of the Vietnam War, war era in the US, um, you might have heard of the Pentagon Papers, which were kind of these top secret materials that came out of um, the military apparatus and um, the papers, a lot of them showed that certain events were presented to the U.S. people um, in order to kind of convey um, the necessity of having to fight the in the Vietnam War. Um, and sometimes those um, facts, that, facts, quote unquote, that were presented to the people in the U.S., were not entirely true. So the Pentagon Papers kind of made that clear for everyone in the US. And um, the New York Times and the Washington Post both received copies of the Pentagon Papers and um, wanted to publish them, of course, to let the people know what was in them. And the case went to the Supreme Court in 1971 in the case New York Times Company versus the United States. And the Supreme Court decided that because of this practice of prior restraint, it was unconstitutional to block the New York Times or the Washington Post from publishing these papers. So you'll be seeing the words prior restraint on your quiz, so just remember, it means that the government cannot prohibit somebody or stop somebody from publishing something without a very compelling reason. However, the courts have also decided over the years that our right to freedom of expression is not absolute. So there are exceptions when the courts will say um, it's fair to limit someone's freedom of expression. So what are those limitations? Um, number one, if someone's inciting a criminal act, um, if they're saying fight, fighting words and um, declaring genuine threats that are that seem to be immediate, um, those would not be protected. Then the Supreme Court has allowed laws that ban threatening symbolic speech. So things like burning a cross on um, an African-American family's home, that would be a threatening form of symbolic speech. Number three, if um, someone is defaming someone else's character, in other words, making false accusations and giving that to the press, that's not protected under our freedom of speech. And obscene materials are not protected. So whether the Supreme Court says something is obscene or not usually depends on the following criteria, whether the average person would find um, the writing or the work excessively lewd, 
whether the work depicts or describes sexual conduct in an offensive way, or whether the work lacks serious artistic, literary, political, or scientific value. Now, the First Amendment also protects our right to assembly, as long as it's peaceful, and the right to petition government officials. So to call your congressman and complain that you don't like that he voted on a particular bill. So we have the right to do that. Then we have the Second Amendment, of course, um, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So the Second Amendment is still pretty controversial um, and largely because of its text. Is it a protection of the right of the states to organize and arm a militia for civil defense? Um, like the National Guard, or is it a protection of a right of the people to individually bear arms, or is it both? Um, so before the Civil War, this distinction wasn't that meaningful because all white males of military age were considered part of the militia and they all had um, guns. But after the Civil War um, is when we kind of first started to see gun control measures being introduced and that was part of the Black Codes, which we'll talk about um, in Chapter 5 more. So it was kind of these laws that were passed after the Civil War to disempower um, the African-American community. And part of that was restricting their ability to um, own guns and defend themselves. Amendment number three, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner prescribed by law. So again, I mentioned this one a couple weeks ago, um, but most people today see this amendment and are kind of confused. We haven't really seen soldiers trying to live in our houses, but if you remember back to Chapter one, um, when I talked about the intolerable acts that England passed um, when we were still colonies, the early American citizens um, had certainly experienced having their cities and towns being occupied by British soldiers, and they viewed the British laws that required colonists to house soldiers very offensive. Amendment number four, um, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So the Fourth Amendment protects us from kind of these overzealous efforts by law enforcement to root out crime. And it does this by ensuring that police and law enforcement have good reason before they intrude on people's lives with criminal investigations. It guarantees that we can expect a certain degree of privacy from government intrusion in our homes. So certainly the recent case of Breonna Taylor, um, you've heard a lot of mentions of the Fourth Amendment um, as her case and lawsuits, uh, her family's lawsuits have um, gone on. So also in the Fourth Amendment, um, you have limitations on both search searches and seizures. So government officials are required to apply for a search warrant prior to a search or seizure, so prior to entering someone's home. And this warrant is a legal document, it's signed by a judge, and it specifically allows the police to search and or seize particular persons or property. 
And importantly, in order for a judge to allow a warrant to be issued, the law enforcement officials have to demonstrate probable cause, meaning that um, they have some sort of proof that a crime has been or will be committed to justify getting that warrant. So it can't just be hearsay. They need to present the judge with very specific um, documented proof that getting into someone's home and searching and seizing is necessary. Number five, this one's another one that contains quite a bit. So no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So the First and the Fifth Amendment both contain um, quite a lot in them. So Fifth Amendment, if you look at that little graphic here, you've got a right to be tried by an impartial grand jury of your peers. You've got a right to due process under the law. You've got a right to just compensation if the government ever, um, let's say you live nearby a highway that's being constructed and the government comes and says, look, we need to bulldoze your home so we can finish this highway. We're going to give you um, $200,000 to move so that we can do that. So that's an example of the government taking your property but providing um, just compensation for it. So they can't just take your home and not give you anything. And double jeopardy, we will see on the quiz. I'll go over that on, um, in the following slides. And self-incrimination. So if you ever heard people say, I plead the fifth, that's the right to not witness against yourself during a trial or when being questioned by law enforcement. So let's go through these here. So number one, the first clause requires that serious crimes be prosecuted only after an indictment issued by a grand jury. So you have to be presented in front of a jury of your peers, of people who live in your community, um, and they will decide whether or not a case can be made against you. Number two, double jeopardy. You'll see this on your quiz. Um, so what is je double jeopardy? It's a process that subjects a suspect to prosecution twice or more for the same crime. And this only applies at the same level of government. So for instance, um, if you went to state to court at the state level and they found um, that you were not guilty, you could then appeal it to a higher federal court for the same crime um, and hope to be found not guilty. However, you cannot be tried for the same tr crime at the same level of government. So you can't be tried in the state courts for the same crime twice. So if you're tried for a crime at the state level, found not guilty, the same state court cannot put you back on trial for that crime. So that's double jeopardy. Can't be tried for the same thing twice. Then you've got protections against self-incrimination. Again, that kind of, I plead the fifth. Um, the right to remain silent. So people have a right not to give evidence to law enforcement that might constitute an admission of guilt or responsibility. 
In addition, if someone does not testify in their own defense during a criminal trial, that failure to testify or pleading the fifth can't be used as evidence of guilt. And the Fifth Amendment is kind of where we get, if you've ever heard of our Miranda rights, when you get um, apprehended by law enforcement, it's required by the police or any law enforcement officials to inform you of your rights, including the right against self-incrimination before being interrogated. And so usually if you get pulled over, the cops will say, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to an attorney. And if you can't afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. And the fourth part of the Fifth Amendment forbids the federal government from depriving people of their life, liberty, and property without due process of law. So what's due process? It means that everyone will be treated fairly and impartially by government officials. And the last part of the Fifth Amendment is that takings clause, which limits the government's ability to take your personal property away. So the government does have um, this economic liberty that we refer to as eminent domain, meaning that if the government decides that they need a certain property in order to pursue redevelopment or infrastructure, they have a right to do so. Um, and they have a right to go to anyone who's kind of owns private property in that area that the government needs and offer that person a certain amount of money in order to relocate. All right, the Sixth Amendment will also be on your quiz. So we'll take a little time to go through the provisions of the Sixth Amendment here. So first I'll read it off for you. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and the cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have assistance of counsel for his defense. So what's that all mean? So first part of the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to have a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury in the same state and district where the crime is located. So this right protects people from being detained indefinitely by the government. The second part guarantees the right of those of accused of crimes to present witnesses in their own defense. So law enforcement can't just put a bunch of witnesses against you up. You have the right to bring in your own witnesses when you're in court to defend you. In addition, um, you have the right to confront and cross-examine witnesses that are presented um, to testify against you. So you can cross-examine them and ask them your own questions. Number three guarantees the right of those accused of crimes to have the assistance of an attorney in their defense, kind of what we call today a public defender. And this particular liberty was put to the test in 1963 during a court case um, at the Supreme level called Gideon versus Wainwright. So Clarence Gideon, this little man over here in the picture, he was um, a homeless man, not very well off, and I guess he'd wandered to Panama City, Florida, and he was accused um, by the city of breaking into and stealing money and other property from a pool hall. 
Now, when he went to court, he was not provided with a lawyer to help in his defense. Again, he was kind of a poor drifter, so he didn't have money to hire a lawyer. Um, and he ended up being convicted to a five-year prison term. But again, he had no one to really represent him. He didn't have an attorney in that state-level um, Florida case. So while in prison, Gideon got some paper, did some studying, and wrote to the Supreme Court directly from his jail cell asking them to hear his case. And the court did hear his case, and they ruled in his favor unanimously, which is very rare on the Supreme Court, that every single person on the court ruled in his favor and said that anyone accused of a serious crime was entitled to the assistance of a lawyer, even if they could not afford one. And that is why we have the um, kind of industry of public defenders today. So that's Gideon versus Wainwright, and you'll see that on the quiz as well. Alrighty, here we have the Seventh Amendment. Um, which we're gonna kind of breeze through, but I'll read it for you. So in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. So this one's basically saying even in civil disputes, um, like you get in a car accident, a little fender bender, if you wanted to, you could um, take that case to trial and have the right to um, have a jury to decide it for you. Now, in most cases of civil disputes, um, people just agree to pay a fine and bypass their right to have a jury and a full trial, but According to the Seventh Amendment, if you wanted to have a jury and a full trial in a civil dispute, it is within your right. And we have the Eighth Amendment. So Eighth Amendment will also be on your quiz. So we'll take a minute here. Um, so the Eighth Amendment reads, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. It's short and sweet, but it's a very important amendment um, in the Bill of Rights. So number one, bail. It's a payment of money that allows a person accused of a crime to be freed until their trial, so they don't have to sit in jail till the, their trial date. So if you don't show up for your trial after paying your bail, you forfeit the money you paid, um, and then in this day and age, a lot of people can't afford their bail, so they might get a bail bond, which allows them to pay maybe 10% of the bail to another person who then sells the bond and pays the full amount. Um, if you ever heard of, of Dog the Bounty Hunter, <laughs> he's a bail bondsman. Um, and then people who are believed likely to flee or who pose a threat to the community or the country usually are not offered bail. So that's bail, and the Supreme Court has ruled that an excessive fine is one that is, quote, so grossly excessive, so, so obviously excessive, that it forces a person to sell all or most of their property to pay it, or, quote, grossly disproportional to the gravity of the crime in question. So for instance, in this little comic up top, the judge says, you're going to jail for 22 years, pal. And this little child is crying and says, I took a candy bar. So that would be a grossly disproportional sentence to the crime. If you stole a dollar candy bar, going to jail for 22 years is a little bit or a lot excessive um, in terms of your punishment. Then the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth, we'll go over um, really quickly. We got the Ninth that says the enumeration in this Constitution of certain rights, 
shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So this is basically a disclaimer um, that they put in here saying, yes, we listed all these specific rights in amendments one through eight, but that does not mean that any rights that we forgot to put in here or we didn't explicitly list, um, it doesn't mean that the people don't still have those rights or retain them. So just because something isn't explicitly listed in here doesn't mean that the um, national government should think that we don't still retain those rights. So again, to ensure that those interpreting the Constitution in the future would recognize that the listing of freedoms and rights in those previous eight amendments was not an exhaustive list. So for instance, we regularly exercise and take for granted rights that are not written down anywhere in our federal constitution, like the right to marry, the right to privacy, which we'll talk about again in a minute, um, the right to seek opportunities for employment and education, and the right to have children and raise a family. So not everything's written down, but the Ninth Amendment says that just because it's not written down doesn't mean that they're not our rights. And the Tenth Amendment, back to this push and pull between national power and state power. Um, it reads, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So basically anything that's not listed in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights as a specific um, responsibility of the national government, like um, maintaining a military and coining money, so things like that are specifically listed for the national government, but anything that's not explicitly listed or not explicitly um, prohibited or disallowed to the states are reserved to the states. So that was kind of that disclaimer that the Anti-Federalists put in there to ensure that the national government wouldn't take uh, more power than they should. Now I said we'd come back to right to privacy, so this will be um, your 10th question for chapter four on the quiz. So just keep in mind that the term privacy does not actually appear in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. And so commonly, um, we talk about our right to privacy, but in terms of what is explicitly stated in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, privacy doesn't appear anywhere. However, a lot of scholars have interpreted several of those Bill of Rights um, provisions and amendments as an indication that the framers sought to protect a common law right to privacy, a right to be free of government intrusion into our personal life, particularly within the boundaries of our home. So some of the amendments um, that they look at to argue for this would be the Second Amendment, which can be interpreted to mean that we have the right to defend ourselves in our home. We got the Third Amendment, which states that government soldiers cannot occupy anyone's home, which pretty much means that your home should be a realm of privacy, off limits for government to enter. Um, the Fourth Amendment sets a very high legal standard for government officials to enter your home, again, for those searches and seizures. The Fifth Amendment sets a very high legal standard for someone taking someone's home or property, that takings clause. And then again, as we just talked about, that Ninth Amendment, which basically said anything that's not specifically listed in here doesn't mean that we don't have or retain those rights. So that right to privacy could be interpreted as one of those unlisted rights mentioned in the Ninth Amendment. So generally, the courts do uphold our right to privacy, although 
again, it's never specifically listed anywhere in the Constitution. So it's more a matter of interpretation here. And that is it. That's your quiz review for chapter four. Kind of just went over the basics, a little shortened version of the PowerPoint slides for you. And let me know if you have any questions before you get to the chapter four quiz. Happy to explain anything further. Um, and I hope you all have a great day. I'll see you soon. Bye.